Hello there, my name is Mike Squirrel. I'm the Chief Technology Officer for TTEC. Today we'd like to talk you through some ideas and supporting concepts and technologies that we believe can significantly streamline the movement of goods uh, through the supply chain into free zone facilities, bonded warehouses, etc. Um, the uh, diagram I'm showing you today is really kind of what I'd like to cover in, in the agenda today. It's about how um, agencies can monitor and control uh, the goods as they're being transported from the port of loading to the port of discharge around how that pre-arrival manifest uh, that's lodged for air and sea cargo can be efficiently uh, received by customs and admissibility risk assessment can be performed from that, um, from that manifest and the associated bills of lading pre-arrival which is effectively you know an admissibility, an admissibility risk assessment you know are the goods admissible for on, on the grounds of uh, health safety and security and then in and then from there you obviously you know those goods are going to be passed to you know a freight forwarder or a carrier who's going to then move those goods to a bonded warehouse or a free zone facility so we're then looking about how the process of guarantees sureties or bonds can be linked to the shipments, all done effectively pre-arrival or very, very close to arrival. So that as soon as the, go, so that as soon as the goods arrive at port, unloaded at the port, they can be moved straight onto the equipment. The equipment can travel securely through virtual corridors between the port facilities and the free zone operations um, so that there's effectively um, extremely minimal risk that goods will um, be offloaded from the means of transport and enter into the economy with no taxes and duties paid. Um, then effectively once those goods have uh, traveled from the port of uh, from the port of arrival through to the free zone facility and passed through the en route controls uh, there's then obviously then going to be some arrival controls we'll show how we envisage those can take place based upon best practice and then at that point the goods can then enter a bonded warehouse or a free trade zone. Um, and we can talk about how we've got some mechanisms whereby, you know, effectively we only have the contents of, of one document that's used across all of these different steps in the process and how that information can be moved and transferred to each document, which means that you know, the, the electronic paperwork associated with each step in this process is kept to an absolute minimum. You'll note that I've not even talked about customs declarations yet. Um, you know, it's our firm view that any form of a customs declaration shouldn't be lodged unless the goods are actually entering the economy. But clearly, if the goods are only uh, going to a free zone facility and potentially even re-exported, there should be no reason for a operator to lodge a customs declaration. So we've really just left that step as optional here. Effectively, you'd only look at lodging of declarations if the goods are leaving a free trade zone or a bonded warehouse and entering the local economy at that stage. So this is what I'd like to cover today. Um, what we'll do first of all is we'll talk a little bit about how we can track and control and monitor uh, the goods as they are being moved from the port of loading through to the port of discharge. Okay, I'm going to talk a bit about vessel targeting and advanced cargo information. I'm just going to briefly talk a little bit about uh, what these systems do and then uh, we'll walk you through what they look like in, in reality. Um, effectively, uh, a, a vessel targeting system or an aircraft targeting system identifies the locations and details of the vessels that are entering your sovereign borders uh, pre-arrival. So they allow you to, for example, identify vessels or aircraft that are going to be arriving in your territory within the next six to eight hours, or in sometimes a vessel's cases, you would likely know that a vessel is due to um, arrive possibly up to one month in advance. They allow you to identify some su suspicious behavior, such as uh, spoofing, where you know vessels actually jump locations. Um, or they've gone dark, where it means that the, the vessel master has perhaps switched off their uh, AIS transponder, or perhaps where ship-to-ship uh, -ship, uh, transfers might have taken place on the high seas, which might indicate some attempts at smuggling. Now, 
as the vessels get closer to the next uh, point of arrival, um, the Customs Authority and the Port Authority will generally receive the manifests and the bill of lading and some other information related to those uh, vessels as well, such as the, the cargo bay plan um, and the crew lists and also likely what we call the COPRA documents. These are the COPRA discharge and loading documents, which indicate uh, what containers are going to be uh, taken off the vessel and what uh, containers are going to be loaded onto the vessel. Um, as, we, as those pieces of information are received, we actually fuse that all together with the vessel information so that um, a real-time risk assessment can be made um, of the vessel and its cargo uh, before it arrives at the port. So this is what a pre-arrival vessel targeting system looks like. Right now, as you can see, I've put in an area of interest around the waters around uh, the United Arab Emirates. And here's a list of all of the vessels inside that particular area of interest. Right now, the highest risk vessel is the Fox, uh, a Togo registered vessel um, headed to Kismayo, uh, south of Mogadishu in Somalia. It's been highlighted uh, where the AIS transponder on the vessel has so potentially gone dark uh, for a couple of times over, the, over a fairly recent period of time. So obviously cargo on that vessel is perhaps of, of more interest. If we now just have a look at a, at a watch list here. I'm going to look at a vessel here. This is uh, just kind of sample data that I'm showing you here. I'm going to look at the Merce Kimi um, and I'm going to just have a look at the details of that particular vessel. Here's the vessel details. Uh, the Tamersk vessel, uh, Liberian registered. Um, and let's have a look. Let's have a look at the container level risk on this vessel. Um, you can see here that we've got uh, a bit of a score on narcotics on this particular vessel. I'm just going to drill into this. And we can see the Builds the, the container numbers here and the associated bills of lading. You can see actually that we actually have one, two, three, four, five containers that are actually all on the same bill, uh, which is interesting. So I'm just going to have a look at one of these. Um, here's the container risk. It's uh, highlighting that there could be some issues around routing. Uh, let's have a look. I'm now pulling up the container status messages. For that particular container. So this particular container, it uh, was gated out uh, in uh, Van Lo, um, in the Netherlands, um, and then was transshipped by land to the port of Rotterdam. From the port of Rotterdam, um, it travelled uh, on this vessel here. It travelled on the MSC Bari from Rotterdam to Singapore. Uh, which took uh, just under a month. It was discharged from Singapore, loaded on another vessel, the MSC Lenny, and discharged at uh, Qingdao in China and then gated out. So these container status messages are very useful. They provide some end-to-end -end supply chain visibility of each container uh, that we see, uh, not just from maybe the last port of call and where it was loaded on the last vessel, but right from when it started the journey through to when it finished the journey, including quite often um, where it might have moved over land. So this allows us to identify, for example, containers that might have started in Kandahar, Afghanistan, moved by land to the port of Karachi in Pakistan, and then traveled from Karachi to the rest of the world. So we can identify high risk routes, irregular routes, etc., etc using this type of technology. Um, the other thing that we can do is we can look at the vessel stow plan. So if we look here at this particular vessel stow plan, this is a list of all of the containers on the vessel. So I can actually, this is pulling from the, this is pulling from the bay plan. So this is our bay plan viewer. So we can look at all of the different types of containers. For example, if we want to look where the high queue briefers are, there's just a few of them and there they are on the vessel. We can also look at this from a risk perspective as well. We can then take a standard slice of the vessel, like so, look at the container, 
and then uh, let's have a look at the status messages for this particular container here. Okay, loaded from Malaysia through to uh, through to Newark in New York. Uh, let's look, for example, at another one here. This one uh, loaded uh, in uh, Guangzhou, uh, transshipped by Singapore and port side in Egypt through to the port of uh, Misrata in Libya. So, you know, based upon the, the routing, um, this might be considered slightly higher risk than average. So this allows us to have a very, very good gauge of vessel information, information related to the bill of lading, um, and the container level risk information. Uh, and we can take that information and we can combine it and identify risks at manifest level, bill level, container level, etc. before the vessel arrives. So what you're looking at right now um, is a uh, work list of uh, high risk cargo that an analyst has identified. I'm logged in as an analyst at the moment and we've got some sample data in here. So this is a list of uh, high risk shipments that have already been identified and you can see uh, some details here related to the manifest and who they've been assigned to. Let's just have a look at one of these. This is the manifest itself, to it's see manifest, uh, and it tells us things like, you know, what the vessel was, who the agent was, and here we have a master bill associated with it. Uh, we've got um, a consignee here, uh, Lao Yang Guanha Chemical, uh, going to the consignee of uh, Cutter Gas. Um, well, one of the things we can do is, as you can see, there's very little information showing here on the on the bill, uh, but we do have some some bill risk information here. So it's hit a number of rules in relation to security, a little bit for narcotics and a little bit for revenue. Um, but you know, where we have a bill where we don't have a lot of information, which is quite a common problem, is we look at the information that we do have and derive a little bit more insight. So, for example. We can see that the consigner was uh, Liao Heng Guanjia Chemical. We can uh, resolve this company using our global trade atlas. So we can look at this company here. And I'm going to investigate a little bit more about it. Liao Heng Guanjia Chemical. We've got their address here. Uh, we can see that they trade uh, a fair bit with India, USA, Japan, Korea, etc., etc. And they're trading predominantly in organic chemicals. And these are the HS, the global HS6 codes of the chemicals that they generally trade in. Um, so they're trading in dimethyl disulfite, which is uh, flammable, uh, which is their, their number one export. And they're also uh, trading in uh, sulfur lane, which is not so dangerous, but it's kind of a, an irritant. So, you know, this is this. So based upon the fact that, you know, we know the exporter, we know what they typically export. We have already have a fairly good idea uh, what the goods are that they're exporting. So we can use tools like this to actually drill through um, an, a company's entire global supply chain and risk assess it accordingly. So the other thing um, on the analyst dashboard is that um, we have here we have uh, the list of manifests that are on their work list, and here we actually have all other shipments that are coming in right now. So uh, we can obviously sort and filter these based upon, say, for example, I might just want to look at uh, only those uh, manifests that are coming in by C. We'll filter those down and I might select, for example, the particular checkpoint or the agent or, or some other defining feature. Then I can quickly sort these from high risk to low risk. See here we've actually got some which have had some predictive hits on them as well. So. I could, for example, if I look at uh, narcotics threats, I'm just going to sort these from high risk to low risk. And as you can see here, I can drill into the manifest. I can identify uh, the bills in that manifest that have been identified as higher risk. And I can look and identify why those particular bills were subject uh, to, the, to, the, to the risks associated with them. So this is a really good way for customs to triage uh, the manifests and uh, and the bills at a very very high level. We can even go in and uh, look at this straight from bill level. So here's a list of all of the bills that are coming in. I can sort these from high risk to low risk, for example, based on, in this case, uh, narcotics threats. 
So I can then look at this particular bill, I can look at it and I can look at the threats that are associated with it, both at bill level, here we have a number of issues here, um, and at container level, here we've got some container rules that are fired. Uh, this is in relation to you know, the gross weight being a little bit under what we would expect to be for that type of container. And the fact that the container number registered doesn't meet the ISO standard for a container number. These are common discrepancies. I mean, any one discrepancy is maybe not so important. But if you see a transport document with multiple discrepancies, each of those discrepancies has a score associated with it. And so, you know, those, 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 those documents with, with more discrepancies, with more suspicious information, they gradually rise to the top of the list. And so we've got some complex statistics and maths and machine learning that sit underneath that to make sure that the heist risk trade uh, goes to the top of the list. So now let's assume that um, the goods that are being imported into the country um, have uh, been imported, they've, they've, they've arrived at the port and they have completed the pre-arrival risk assessment process, which the vast majority of goods would just be simply cleared through the risk assessment using modern tools. Um, Let's talk a little bit around bonds, guarantees and sureties. Now, as you can appreciate, when goods are entering a free trade zone, um, any duties or taxes owed uh, for those goods are effectively deferred um, because uh, you know, the goods are not entering the economy. Um, but effectively, you know, both a, a freight forwarder that might be moving those goods uh, from the port to the free zone and or the, the facility or the free zone operator will generally take out a bond with customs to guarantee the taxes and duties owed uh, for the goods that are held in that location so that if the event that they can't at a later date be reconciled and there is a suspicion that they entered the economy that customs can be uh, reimbursed for the lost revenue. But Rather than just focusing on the, on kind of the, the simple use of bonds, I want to talk a little bit about what we call comprehensive guarantees. Now, comprehensive guarantees are a, a fairly new concept and it's strongly supported by the World Customs Organization. The great thing about comprehensive guarantees is that they significantly reduce the administrative and paperwork overhead required by uh, freight forwarders, uh, warehouse operators and traders that are importing a lot of goods, potentially moving a lot of goods uh, uh, under bond or transiting a lot of goods. Because as a general rule, under traditional methods, they have to take out a guarantee, an individual guarantee, uh, either for each shipment or the individual guarantee is only applicable to a certain customs regime, such as, I don't know, import or transit. And it's only valid for a short time, say three or six months. So, you know, they're continually having to renew guarantees and negotiate new arrangements with the banks and insurance companies. The great thing about a comprehensive guarantee is that they cover multiple customs regimes and procedures. Um, they cover things like duty suspension and deferred payments, and they're typically valid for one to two years at a time. Um, you can do a lot of things with comprehensive guarantees. You can set various levels so that uh, customs, you know, based upon a trusted trader or authorised economic operator policy, um, the trader might only be required to put up a guarantee for a certain percentage of the value of the goods, might not be for the full taxable amount. But, you know, the controls are in place there such that uh, the trader or the, the bondholder doesn't exceed the authorised limit, so that they avoid penalties or shipments being stopped. Um, the other thing that's great is that you know subsidiary companies or related parties can also, also be authorised to, to share um, a comprehensive guarantee that might have been authorised uh, for a parent company, which again massively simplifies administration and paperwork across the larger, uh, the medium to large size companies. Um, and really, you know, if you're looking at setting up, uh, you know, a long deferred payment account with customs, that you know, a comprehensive guarantee is often considered a prerequisite before customs will open that sort of an account. So, you know, the major advantages here, you know, is that customs obviously are short of payment from the from the guarantee or the bond the bond issuer. Um, the goods can generally be immediately released if they're admissible um, on health, safety and security grounds. Um, the accounting and payment process is really, really fast. 
um, it just happens within seconds because you're basically just deducting the estimated duties off the bond. Um, it massively speeds up transit and other in-bond movements. Um, and it can be extended significantly to simplify administration of bonded warehouse operators, free zone operators, etc. Um, from a trader's perspective, obviously uh, deferred payments great, um, significantly improves their working capital. And effectively, the, the major benefit here is that it helps the goods clear the port and enter the free zone as quickly and as efficiently as possible. Uh, and whilst customs feel that their fiscal risks have been taken care of. So, you know, we do strongly support that customs administrations implement systems and processes that support the concept of comprehensive guarantees. So just to show you what this looks like in practice, um, I'm going to show you a small part of the revenue and account management uh, process within Board Division, which is our customs declaration processing system. Um, I'm currently logged in as um, a freight forwarding as a freight forwarding officer with some fiscal responsibilities. So I'm going to look at the bonds and the guarantees that are associated with my with my company. So. As you can see here, I actually have uh, a comprehensive guarantee that's been uh, activated uh, and it's being used for the transit procedure. Uh, if I actually look in a little bit more detail, this is the summary of my comprehensive guarantee. I can see the total guarantee amount. I've got the amount that's been locked based upon current uh, transactions against the guarantee and the balance of the account remaining, which allows me to perform further actions against the, against the guarantee. It talks of, this is currently a, uh, this is a bank guarantee and it gives me the name of the guarantor and it also tells me which which customs procedures this is authorized for whether and also whether there's any uh, duty suspension or deferred payment uh, configuration for that particular for that particular guarantee here we have a list of transactions against the guarantee so here we can see effectively the statement of transactions that have been uh, lodged against the guarantee over the last over the last month, and I can look. I can effectively click on these transactions, pull them up, and I can see here I've actually got a, a transit that was authorised across this uh, across this bond, and so I can see here what the loading details were, where it went from, where it went to, where it is, when it where it went, and also effectively when the guarantee is likely to be discharged based upon this shipment. So. This kind of information is very. This this kind of information is incredibly useful, both for customs and for the and for the and for the guarantee account holders, because it obviously helps them manage their risks a lot more. They can keep track of they can keep track of their shipments much better because they've got everything all in. They've got everything under one place. Here you can see in this example there was just uh, a small amount of transit uh, debt that was locked under that guarantee and there were some fixed fees that were paid as well in the invoice. So this gives you an example as to how this type of, uh, as to how the, these type of uh, programs can integrate properly within the custom system so that there's some good uh, fiscal transparency uh, on both sides. Okay, so the goods have arrived at the port and the freight forwarder and the warehouse operator we know already have a bond or a guarantee lodged against their name. Now let's talk about um, in-bond movements. These are kind of what we see as the 10 recommended practical steps to implement really, really streamlined in-bond movements from, say, a port to a free zone. First thing, um, obviously, is to facilitate the trader to move the, the goods in-bond just using the information from the bill of lading. Don't want to have to fill out any extra forms or fill in a customs declaration or something like that to, uh, to move the goods from the port to the free zone. Customs quickly and efficiently perform a risk assessment for health, safety and security purposes. You allow a guarantee to be linked to the goods valuation that's listed on the bill of lading if it's accurate to mitigate any potential revenue risk for customs. You're then assigning the goods uh, in the bill of lading to one or more uh, equipment like a truck or a rail car. And then you're monitoring uh, that equipment as it moves from the port to the free zone. Um, and you know the key here is to implement some good controls around the movement of the equipment itself, but not so much on the goods, um, because it's uh, a lot more streamlined and a lot more efficient. Um, 
customs and the traders should work together to develop a, a pre-configured uh, set of authorised inborn movement routes and some control points and measures. Um, now those on route controls, again, they can be largely automated. And again, automate the goods departure, on route control and arrival controls as much as is practically possible within the country. Uh, the bonded uh, amount should automatically be released once the arrival of the goods has uh, been completed satisfactorily. And the key thing here is to ensure that a goods declaration is lodged only at the time that the goods may formally enter the economy, if indeed that happens at all. So let me show you how easy it can be for a carrier or a freight forwarder to complete the electronic uh, form to initiate a bonded movement. What I'm looking at here is a list of manifests uh, under th that have been brought in by this particular carrier that I'm logged in as, and I'm going to generate a transit note or an inbound movement note. I'm now going to fill in some very, very basic information. It already knows that, uh, based upon who I'm logged in as, that I already have a comprehensive guarantee assigned to my company, and it's already pre-filled that in. This is all the information that was pulled from the bill of lading. Uh, I know it's going from here, a becker to a bore. I'm not going to change that. I'm going to set the departure time for this particular the estimated departure time for this particular shipment. Any document details that need to be associated. We've already got the bill of lading associated with this. It's already been pre-entered. I'm now just going to select the uh, the equipment that this needs to go on. So I'm just going to select the registration number of the vehicle, this one here. Okay, it's already filled in the driver of that vehicle. It's already pre-configured in the system. Um, and I think we're good to go. I'm just going to submit this now. And that has now completed the uh, electronic paperwork for generating a transit shipping. So here we can see what's happening a little bit later on in the journey. The goods have departed. They're going from this checkpoint here, number one, to checkpoint number five, the arrival point. As you can see, they've already departed and they've already passed through checkpoint number one. They are now currently en route to checkpoint number two. Uh, as a customs officer, I can see the registration number of the vehicle, the containers that are on the vehicle, and roughly when they should be arriving at the next checkpoint. Once they arrive, I can go in and check my en route controls, make sure everything's okay, submit, and good, they're off. And uh, that uh, has now been updated and uh, the uh, truck and the containers are now moving on to the next waypoint before they uh, reach their uh, the arrival point. Once they've reached at the arrival point, then like this one here, this one's arrived. Uh, you can see that the customs has already signed this one off, which means that the goods have now arrived at the final checkpoint, and that means that the bond would have been released from the freight forwarder that transported this particular container. So just to quickly recap what you saw there, um, we took the existing bill of lading and we automatically generated a draft uh, shipping note from that information. We linked uh, that information to the equipment that's going to move the goods in bond and we also linked it to the freight forwarders bond and guarantee. We selected the departure and the arrival location and, and the paperwork was completed. It was as simple as that. Once the goods were underway, uh, the customs officer selects the predefined route that the equipment will take, submits the departure, the en route controls, um, they monitor it, the goods arrive at the destination, the bond is released, um, and the ownership of the goods moves from the uh, freight border to the free zone operator or the bonded warehouse officer. It's a very, very streamlined four-step process. Now I'd like to show you the next generation cargo control and tracking solution um, called C-Track. This provides the capability for the relevant agencies to precisely track and monitor where the goods and the equipment are as they're moving in bond from the port to the free zone. It utilizes uh, mobile devices, GPS tracking, e-seals, um, and a network of fixed cameras um, in various strategic locations to, to pinpoint and verify where the truck is, where the driver is, and where the cargo is, 
at any point in the process. So this system provides really four key benefits. It provides some control for the customs authority so that they can monitor and control the overall status of, the, of, each, of each movement in real time and even communicate with the driver of the truck um, where required, for example, if they have a, a breakdown or some uh, incident that occurred on the journey. So they can electronically file incident reports using this system as well. They can view where all of the inbound movements are at any time, anywhere. Uh, when the driver's completed the journey, they sign off on a cargo inspection report, they take photos, and this process then transfers the responsibility of the cargo from the freight forwarder to the, uh, to the warehouse or the, uh, or the free zone operator. And the other thing we can do is we can measure the driver's effectiveness. Were they on time? Were the goods undamaged? Uh, did they have any breakdowns or something like that? So this allows us to highlight, for example, poor or unsafe drivers or uh, unprofessional carriers so that they can be penalized and also the, you know, the more careful drivers can be rewarded. Let me show you what this looks like. Here we have uh, an example of a container being lifted uh, off the crane from the yard. The container number has been identified and it is now, we have the uh, truck pulling up at the wharf. The container is being unloaded, the container number has been identified. We know that that container has now been loaded on the truck. For each of the bays at the wharf, we can see which truck is where, whether it's laden or unladen, if there are any hazards, etc. And here we have some en route controls where we have trucks driving uh, down effectively a virtual corridor and we're ensuring that the container um, number that's on the truck is in, fact the con is in fact on the truck that it's supposed to be and in the location that it's supposed to be in. If we look at that in a little bit more detail, here we have a slightly better video here. So here you can see uh, a camera set up at a waypoint um, and as you can see, we've got some truck stop to traffic lights. Here's a truck with two containers, both of the numbers being recognized. Um, so this allows us to manage um, en route controls and verify the movement of the goods, even in busy locations such as the ones that we're showing you right now. So this is, this is effectively largely automating that process. So lastly, I'll just briefly explain um, the final step in the process. So the goods have arrived at the free zone. Uh, they're currently in uh, possession of the freight forwarder. So now the uh, free zone operator will physically receive the goods and the freight forwarder will complete the arrival controls and unload the goods at the facility. Um, both the freight forwarder and the facility only need to agree that the goods have been received satisfactorily. And then there's effectively then a transfer of control. So the inbound shipping note is discharged. And a facility receipt document is automatically correct, created once the arrival controls are determined to have been completed satisfactorily. There's then a transfer of fiscal risk. So the bonded value that was previously um, owned by the freight border, uh, you know, that is discharged based upon the value of the goods, and that liability is then transferred to the facility operator's bond automatically. So as you can appreciate, this cuts back on a huge amount of work that is currently largely done manually. So that's kind of gives you a good feel for the end-to-end for the -end process.